This is Big Man Tyrone, and you're about to watch the MTG Cabal cast with your hosts, Wode, Thirsty, and Reptar. Sub to us on all your podcast networks at MTG Cabal Cast and YouTube. All right, guys, welcome to the newest episode of the Cabal Cast. So this week, we're going to cover something that we've kind of beaten to death uh, over the past uh, pretty much year. Yeah. And the holiday price stagnations and what we expect actually happens in early 2020. Uh, because at least for me, I'm my expectations are very different than what they usually are every year. Okay. So let's get started then. Okay. Uh, so we were going to take this format by format like we did uh, last week and start at the top with standard. And basically what we're seeing is standard right now is kind of stagnant. We had the initial spikes uh, for the Golo deck, then we had everything for Oko so that people could play standard until they realized that it was this boring format. And yeah. now, if it's not a multi format staple, then it's tapered off. So basically, you're looking at Oko, Brazen Borrower, Gilded Goose as some of your. And, and we're not talking about showcase or um, yeah. alter, we're just talking about base set cards here, right? Yeah, the million variations of every card in standard. Yeah, we're talking about <clears throat> like uh, LCD, the lowest common de denominator here. These are non-foil uh, draft pack openable cards. Yeah. Right? These are just being highly stagnant right now. The field has just kind of settled in after uh, Mythic Championship 7, and it's basically the same three decks that it was leading in, coming out. Um, what is it? The, the Jund Legend from Brawl is really the only standard card that's most likely going yeah. to uptick coming out of this because it's the only card that hasn't been banned yet. Huh. And yeah. big box yeah. retail is, re is restocking them. But standard as a whole, like I said, for anything that's just standard viable and related is just kind of flat right now. The castles yeah. are flat, despite the fact that they are very powerful. The planeswalkers that are still available in standard, flat, you know. No. Oko is the only one that's seen any like volatility, and that's just based on Pioneer. And Legacy, Who knows what's happening? Legacy and Vintage. It's yeah. playable there. Same thing with Brazen Borrower. That's why these are kind of our outliers, right? Yeah. And then you, but then you look at something like the Temples that only have two printings, and the foils on those are ridiculously cheap right now. Yep. Whether they they tick up moving forward into 2020, uh, that's kind of a, a TBD for our predictions on this, but. As, as our baseline, we're just seeing a, a disinterest in whole and standard and very flat prices. Yep. Then I, I really can't talk, talk much about Brawl because nobody here plays it and, and nobody, nobody seems anywhere to care does. anymore. Wizards, Wizards killed that as effectively as they're trying to kill modern. Yep. So. Which I wanted to get to next, actually, because it is mirroring standard as well. I noticed last week modern prices are fairly flat. But yeah. we at least have modern events uh, beginning in 2020. And so, hopefully they start getting people to show up to them because the last few have not had that great of attendance, unfortunately. Yes. Also, for what it's worth, the face-to-face -face tournament series just swapped out standard for legacy in a number of locations. Yeah. So the basically the second largest tournament series that isn't sponsored by WotC in North America has swapped standard for legacy. Yep. So there's that. Uh, we might see SCG that. pick up more modern over standard if things continue to stagnate. But with modern, we basically have, what is it? the big two or three actually because burn puts up results in a world where everybody's casting spells for zero so you yeah. have uh burn and warza and not miracles but something else i can't remember off the top of my head don't care uh, to look right there now. every now and then as well yeah um uh, it is worth noting that uh in mentioning like pivoting to new formats so there are still four Death events Shadow. that Star one. City has n announced for their S Star City tour yep. that don't have formats. So I would expect that if they're going, or sorry, five, mm. if they're going to switch to be like, hey, forget standard, we want modern, that's going to start in April. And that's when they'll really start hammering yeah. it in. It's interesting. You don't have to pay to see the events, though. I'm glad. Yeah, very. Right. Uh, a bunch of Team Constructed coming in. Yeah, it's like the end of the first season, or the first yeah. half of the year. From Atlanta on. Yeah. A lot of these are used to be modern locations. Yep. Yeah, Syracuse is modern. Okay, that makes sense. 
Worcester has been team or legacy before. Philadelphia is generally modern or legacy. Louisville. Can't be legacy. They've abandoned it now, even yeah. in their team events. Yeah. So it, it's interesting. If they push modern, that's fine. It's just right now it's just a, a three-deck format. Burn, Death Shadow, yeah. and, and Warzone, they just kind of prey on each other, so to speak, where a good hand from either one of them just flat beats the other. So it's this interesting situation. But that kind of that keeps things fairly flat. Yeah. And like a lot of the Modern Horizons hits not looking at Ren and Six because it just saw the Legacy ban have begun to tumble. Rip. Yeah. Yeah. So like, when uh, Modern Horizons hit and the Canopy lands came out, I was like, oh, I'll just buy these lands when they drop. And then they didn't. And then Watsi killed Mod uh, Modern, and I basically picked up all, all the ones I need except for Canyon, Canyon Slough at like 6 to $8 each. That's ridiculous yeah. for when they first came out. <clears throat> like even if I was paying Bylas, I was still paying over. I was most likely over twelve towards fifteen for most of them that weren't uh, Fiery Islet and Canyon Slough. In the first yeah. couple weeks. Like this is another format that just that has decent prices. Everything just continues to tumble. The only card I've seen see a price increase over the last week is Karn Liberated for question mark reasons. I, it's an EDH card and Pioneer, but yeah. No, not Lib. You can't play in a pioneer it's just modern and an edh really edh because tron is like consistently not getting the ban now that mopal is the boogeyman of the format again yeah it's no longer ancient stirrings we've gone back to complaining about mopal yep so uh it's still it because it's in a deck that does well and any artifact that can power out an arcbound ravager on turn one is generally going to get dunked on despite the fact that ravager is not the problem right now yeah i mean it's, it's sam black had a great tweet to the effect and he said something like you know, now that we figured out how to make a Mox Opal deck that's control, combo, aggro, and mid-range, can we ban it so I can play something else? I mean, so, it's not wrong. Yeah, I did. Hey. It, yep. we, we have figured out every archetype that Mox Opal can fit into, which it turns out is all of them. Absolutely. So. Yep. Um, and the, the, the interesting format that we have here, uh, before we get into uh, older things like Legacy, is Pioneer. Yeah. Pioneer is really the only thing that I've seen moving the last couple of weeks and it's not just like jagged sawtooth and a bunch of things, which generally is what's been happening or what happened with the like power week of PTQs. Uh, what yeah. I'm actually seeing on the the several hundred cards that I'm tracking is that the floor overall in the format is actually rising. Yeah, uh, I noted this in the in the Discord today that even things like Aether Hub are finally starting to rise. The card floated between ten and eleven cents buy list on Card Kingdom for the last few weeks for it, ages. Yep, uh, even after uh, people started. Stopped experimenting with the uh, energy deck, or yeah. as they were, it still stayed at ten to eleven, and then all of a sudden, it's seen a thirty percent increase uh, as of yeah. last night. So, dig through time uh, was a card that was all that only maxed out at about two fifty after the first week, and it was three dollars last night when I checked. And yeah. the list goes down everything that they're keeping track of. And so this format, the floor is actually raising right now on a lot of this stuff, and anything that came tumbling down, I think blossoming defense started up super high not like wild slash high yeah but it was like two dollars or something and it's yep. been gradually exactly it took a yeah. hard dive and eventually we'll come back up and it's those cards that aren't going to come back up as high in the the, in the, the short term but they are rising with the rest of the format now which is yeah. pretty pretty interesting and we'll button all this up later we just want to cover the formats now yeah and so for me pioneer's actually been the easiest format for me to make money off of this year despite the fact that it's only been a format for like two months yeah i mean it's it's it killed what was the money maker format uh and made a bunch of bulk rares suddenly worth money yep for like a hot minute and some of them still are yeah but you know i'm not i'm not gonna not buy list my jeskai ascendancies for five dollars oh uh, you know exactly i got rid of my foil thought seizes last week for 35 each or something like that like yeah, my, just something Theros, stupid. Yeah, my Theros ones. I was sitting on them since they were in in standard, just doing nothing because none of the times I cashed out were they worth anything much more than they were prior to Pioneer. And yeah. nobody up here wanted foil thought seasons, despite the fact that I bought a playset from somebody here. Like, Yeah. And that's that's a, a good example of a premium card. I didn't want to move on TCG player because I didn't want somebody to be like, "Oh, well, there's the slightest little thing here, so I'm going to send him. I'm going to send you back one of four. I'm like, what the fuck am I going to do with one? No, I'm stuck with one. What am I yeah. going to do with this? Yeah. Yeah. So, just out of those. And I, I think Pioneer is going to be a long-term boon for anybody who's looking to move cards, compared to yeah. the other formats we're going to cover. 
Uh, this next one I'm going to lump into one, and then you're going to ask, well, where do we go from here with formats? we got two more after it. Uh, legacy and Vintage. And uh, when I talk about these formats, I mean specifically the cards you play in these formats. Not cards that you can play in these formats, because we're not playing Felwar Stone in Legacy, and we're not playing Stal Storm Cauldron in Vintage. You know, The cards that you expect to maintain value in these formats are, and they are seeing their standard YOY increase. Uh, some of them were a little late to the party. We're now seeing Trop yeah. go up as the last couple of weeks. Um, you know, Valk did its thing early on in the year along with UC. Savannah and yeah. Bayou, etc. kind of tracked up during the year as the format changed. And then uh, after the bannings, we didn't really see anything drop down, which is nice. Everything held, which means these yeah. formats, financially, the pillars are still fairly strong. So, like, all this... All the money that I'm making off Pioneer right now, I'm just squirreling away um, uh, as CK credit, and I'm just moving into uh, more duels because they continue to go up. Yeah, that's it. If I want to, if I want to keep Magic cards around that are going to accrue value, I'm not going to wait on anything that can be reprinted. I'm going to sit on uh, oh, duels or whatever. Especially the way supplementary products get printed, and who knows what they're doing. It's just yeah. dumb. Yeah, like, and I, I choose duels over other cards because. I don't need more Mox Diamonds. It's only I'm only going to be able to move so many, despite the fact that they, they do, generally speaking, see a, a much starker increase than yeah. duels do from time to time. Uh, but more people are done buying that deck than they are buying duels overall, and more people yeah. buy duels for formats like EDH than they buy uh, Mox Diamonds. So they're a very easy move when it's time to uh, get out of them, and there's just yeah. a, an easier chance I'll be able to move them at... Uh, let's say eighty percent of TCG low to an actual player and make and do do this transaction cash in hand when I'm ready to go. Yeah, so that's where I am there. And I was kind of interesting looking at vintage coming out of Eternal Weekend because we didn't really see a drop in anything, which is great. There wasn't a yeah. whole lot that just kind of tanked coming out of that and then out of the uh, the ban or the restriction announcement. Yeah, and you're seeing like the usual holiday lull. Right, where like prices stagnate a little bit and some of them drop. But I think, you know, I in, in my opinion, and this is where I said it differs from usual, usually I expect a full recovery come tax season. Uh, this year, just based on like personal consumer confidence and everything else and what I've, you know, been hearing from vendors and everything is people don't expect it to recover as well as it has in the past. I, I They're think... like, you know, rather than, you know, your 10 to 15 cent dip with a 15 to 20% increase. Yep. Some people are fully expecting a 5 to 10% increase afterwards. So there's a possibility that on some of the slower to move stuff, like not duels, but like Mox Diamond, for example, uh, you'll see the floor actually end up a little bit lower mm -hmm. after this potentially, just based on how things are. Yeah, and that, that's similar to my outlook for, for the coming year, too. Um, you know, the... The next format I want to touch on is uh, a little more interesting than the last because the last one is one we harp on all the time. Um, but old school is a format that, much like Legacy and Vintage, you have to be very careful about when you're looking at uh, stocks readings. Yeah. And I have a really good, with two good examples from the past and one really good one now. Uh, old school right now is in a place where only the playables are stagnant. Yeah. Like the old school only playables are stagnant. Not old school cards that are also EDH or old school cards in Legacy or Vintage. No, old school yeah. only are stagnant right now. But there is some bullshit on the rise. Yeah. And uh, you know, the uh there's one person that likes to take credit for the pyramid buyout. They also attempted to corner the market on some blue card. Yeah, Damping Fields one that just went up. I don't know if you have. Yeah, the other I'm one like three hundred of them. It's great. The one that I what well, like the signal flare for this that was just some cheesy bullshit was when Akron Legionnaire showed up on stocks for multiple days yeah. in a row. Akron that was amazing. Legionnaire. Why? Is an eight, I'm going to bring this up on stocks because it's insane. And you're going to look at this graph and you're like, well, there's a spike back in 2018. So obviously, no, obviously nothing. Yeah, that's when the old school boom hit. So yeah. like, of course, that's when it happened. This is an eight four for eight six and two white. For it's not a legend right now. Good. None of your, not even non-artifact creatures may attack except this card, an A4 with no other keyword abilities. And you see the spike, which is the old school boom, and then it tumbles, 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 
cheesy bullshit. Yeah. And so this you got to be careful of because this is a false flag on the format. Or old yeah. school cards as a whole. You're, you're... I'm, I'm not saying I'm doing right by people. I just think this card should not be a dollar. That's all. Oh, yeah, there's absolutely money to make. If you're combing through collections and you find stuff like this and then you can out it to a biologist or somebody who's looking for it because they're trying to get into this, you are uh, you are on the cresting wave and they are the shoreline you're going to crash into and by all means, push all you can on that unsuspecting fool. Go yeah. for it. But as a flag for the format, its health and uh, in terms of playability and price, this is a false flag. Yeah. It's stuff not like real. this. No. Uh, there are some other ones uh, that come come and go in old school, like some of the, the, the gins are useful. It all depends on the popularity of City in a Bottle like and how uh, yeah. how that card works out. And that's such a metagame one, too, yeah. with, like City in a Bottle and some of the others that it's like, you know, it may or may not actually yeah. be relevant. The, the one I'm thinking of is the one that's on socks right now. It's like Mijai Jin. It's the yeah. triple red 6-3 from, from Arabian Nights. Like, that is a card that gets comped by City in a Bottle. Yeah. It's a real card in the format that gets comped by City in a Bottle, but those two will fight on price. You'll see them go up every now and again. Yeah. You know, so that's my little thing about old school. Be very careful with this if you're looking to buy in and move some stuff. you got to make sure that you're basically, if you know you're buying crap, you got to have an out for it immediately. Know you're buying crap, basically. Yeah, essentially. And the last format uh, I wanted to touch on in regards to stagnation is EDH. EDH is doing fine. We have yeah, some it's great, not going anywhere. Nope, we have some great cards uh, that are moving in that format. And the reason I want to tie this one to old school is because there are a number of the, uh, those crossover cards that are seeing a bump because of EDH. And we're looking at things like Angus McKenzie that was on the rise last month. So Lady Eva uh, Evangelia is on the rise yeah. right now. Uh, I think, not Life Matrix, uh, Monoweb is another one that pops up. Yeah. The one that's like, like you got to tap all lands that produce the same color as one that's uh, provided. Right? And these are all yeah. reserveless cards. They are old school, legacy, vintage, playable, sure. But this is EDH demand. Yeah. Like the EDH format as a whole is great right now. You know, there's you got to rely on a lot more resources than just us, us here. you got to look at... Uh, stocks. You got to look at you know people who are in finance as a whole, and you got to look at rec and see what's going on there. And from there, yeah. you can make your move. But you don't have to react as quickly as you do with other formats, which is nice. No, it's not like you know standard. Something gets banned, and all of a sudden, the new tech is completely different, and mm -hmm. it changes overnight with turnover. That's it's not like that. No, and it's it's easy to kind of pinpoint an EDH driven card. Like I mentioned, Angus yeah. McKenzie, Rasputin Dream Reaver, Dreamweaver is on the rise right now on stocks. Uh, and that's been an EDH card forever. Exactly. It goes to sleep. It does some weird stuff. EDH card, hands down. Yeah. And this is this is still our you know bread and butter format. A lot of people are now picking up on that too. I saw a handful of tweets this past week, uh, and this is kind of what brought up the topic of stagnation. Was other people were seeing that you know standard is just flat right now, going yeah. into the new going to the holidays and the new year, which which you know we can kind of predict to be but it seems like we're not going to come out of this lull and they're recognizing that edh is where you you're going to make your money right now that's yeah. that's the place to be uh the Tularian community college put up a video uh, they filmed it like months ago uh, i believe right before the the riw uh popper 1k yeah Right, so this video is wicked old, but they just finished editing it now, talking about their predictions for the game in five years. And very early on in the video, despite the fact this is all just op-ed, you know, both uh, Prof and I think it's Pleasant Kenobi talk about the restructuring of paper to mainly be about supplemental products for EDH, yeah. and positing that you know it <clears throat> takes too many resources to run these tournaments from all parties and all companies involved. The yeah. uh, the overall ROI on uh, boxes is becoming uh, less and less when it comes to standard, and we you have a bunch of feel bad formats in a row. But what always sells well are supplementals, especially yeah. for EDH and Secret Lair. Woo! But at least through EDH, you could begin implement. You could begin introducing modern cards for you know. And I say modern meaning for modern only or legacy, etc. Through EDH supplemental, like you did with True Name and Nemesis, because there are no problems with this. 
You yeah. Know, that's not a dig on them. This is just, you know, if this was something Watsy would do and possibly can do, you know yeah. they're going to fuck it up. Boy, are they. Woo. They'll find a way. Yeah, like releasing it the same weekend as the Grand Prix. That was a good one. That was a solid Watsy internet joke. Taking a tree named Nemesis. But this is probably something we're going to harp on for a while, is yeah. EDH over others. Pretty much. I, I think it's smart. It's clearly correct. And I, I can't imagine it going anywhere else, like in the short term, oh. especially. If I, have I to, just don't see it happening. If I have to vend my... Uh, my Theros pre-release, when, uh, I'm actually going to try and customize my order. And it's just going to be uh, Temples, Shocklands, Fetchlands, uh, Pioneer cards that are between okay. like 3 and $10, and yeah. then like EDH knickknacks, like solid, easy sells, you know, things like uh, a Chroma's Memorial, a Drazi Mon- Monument, some, yeah. some of the actual Drazi Titans, stuff like that, because they'll move. It, yeah, you they know, will. They absolutely will. Those lands are playable in all formats, <clears throat> and they're in standard, so you get some overlap there. But I don't have to worry about sitting on standard cards that nobody cares about anymore. Yeah, which gotta, is important. Yeah, I'm gonna have a room people, a room full of people that come in to play uh, the sealed for standard, and I know at least eighty percent of them will not show up to another standard event or to any standard event really. They only come in and play limited or EDH. Yep. Oh, so I got my audience. Yeah, but. To, to button this all up, what it all what this all comes down to is what 2020 looks like. Yeah. And I, I, I want to hear your take because I think we're going to be pretty close to this, pretty close to aligned. Uh, so 2020 um, gets us four years away from the end of Magic as we know it uh, because I'm still all aboard that five-year plan, which I'm sure is uh, what whatever head is up Watsi's ass at the moment is trying to scream as yeah. loud as they can. Uh, I think that 2020, though, is going to be as awful as this year was. It's going to be, like you said, the year of the supplemental product. Uh, I think without seeing sales numbers, Secret Lair's too easy. It lets them care about the secondary market without caring about the secondary market. Oh, yeah. So, oh, we want Mana Crypt cheap. Here's a Secret Lair of Mana Crypt. It's going to sell forever. Everyone will buy it. People will love it. And, like, just stuff like that that I fully expect them to do, I think we'll get, you know... Mystery booster releases in March or whatever it is. I think so. Oh uh, yeah, because we have we still don't know anything about the stupid undraftable coming up, unplayable or whatever the thing is. Yeah, I, it's unplayable is probably accurate. Yeah, um, twenty two yeah. days to the end of the year, and we don't know what this product is yet. Yeah, I think people stopped um, caring. There's too much stuff. So yeah, and we still have that coming, and I think that you're gonna see. It's going to start drastically affecting vendor confidence, especially the way that high-level play is transitioning mm-hmm. and how the vendor scene is working. I mean, I know a number of vendors that used to do every event, and they're scaling back GPs now. Like, Cool Stuff is not doing all the GPs next year, from what I've heard, because it's just so hard for them to keep up with all this constant change and everything. And like, I, I fully expect that you'll start to see not like a full-on MTG Finance depression. I don't even know that it will be like an MTG Finance recession, but Mm -hmm. you'll start to see like a drop in liquidity outside of like dual lands and EDH cards much more pronounced than you did this year. Yeah. I think that you'll start to see what's going on with foils stabilize. Mm -hmm. And you'll start to see that like the chase cards, like your full art foils, because if they're doing this for Theros, I assume they're doing it beyond Ah, yeah, fuck, got it. Um, I think you'll start to see that, like, it's going to be too much. Mm-hmm. And then in 2021, they're going to knee-jerk rubber band the other way. Okay. That's what I expect. I expect oversaturation because they're going to continue to treat it like a toy market, which is obviously bad. Agreed, yeah. Um, Theros Beyond Death, the pre-release date is January 17th, so we still have about a month left of stagnant standard yeah. into the new year, and I don't think the market's going to change at all between now and then, and no. unless Theros Standard rejuvenates, sorry, unless Theros Beyond Death rejuvenates standard, then I don't think we see the standard market recover. Yeah. And I... I it's probably good 
that they don't have a standard Magic Fest scheduled until the end of March to let that all set yeah. itself that out. Because at that point, if it's the end of March, we're really only three weeks away from uh, Ikoira. Right? Yeah. However, they, they're telling you you're pronouncing a word that I'm pretty sure has roots in Japanese. Um, yeah. And that is a second new standard. So if the standard market stays flat through this through, through this period of time, that means the game is probably boring as hell at the top level. Yep. So people sure are going to start looking for it at other formats, and now you have that infight of Pioneer and Modern. And yeah. I, don't, I don't really think the players become affected by that, for the most part. People who play Pioneer can probably also play Modern and vice versa, so it's not a, a huge jump. And especially yeah. with the last two weeks of no bannings in Pioneer, the form, the, both those formats... Uh, look yeah, it, it seems like it's figured itself out finally, mm -hmm. which which is good. Yeah, I I think that it needed to happen, and I'm glad that like for now it finally did. Uh, even though it does seem like they just want it to be mono control the format, which yeah, whatever. Whatever. You can play aggro control. Jeskai is that deck. Like it's fine. Yeah. Um, but I think the pioneer market is going to, going to continue to rise through that because it's still a nascent market. Now that we're done through all these bannings, and people might say, okay, it's finally time to really buy in. Or we don't have to keep jumping from deck to deck to deck. Yeah. Uh, so we've been waiting. We're going to move in. That That is going to continue to roll in, and I think modern recovers a bit. We're going to, with actual modern events coming up of, of actual consequence, we're going to yeah. see the modern market pick back up. I think standards stay stagnant the entire way through. And yep. I have not checked any of the European circuits, but without legacy in the U.S., that leaves Canada and what's happening in Europe to drive that format. We might see just an absolute stagnation there, aside from the pillars that I mentioned earlier. Yeah. From a vendor perspective, I actually think 2020 might be the year that we see a lot of these monolithic vendors. And when I say that, I mean they are, mon they are mono category, begin yeah. to branch out. Um, Channel Fireball has been supporting Pokemon, I believe, for a little over a year, though they might be kind of quiet about it. They have had a handful of Pokemon articles go up. And yeah. I believe they do have a single section for it. They um, do. Star City did dip their toes into that other uh, WotC game. It's not Beyblade. Those are the little tops you threw at people a couple of years ago. Yeah. It's not Keyforge, but there was that other... Whatever. They've tried it before, and it didn't work, but they're an... In they're an independent organizer, so they might just be able to stick with Magic for the time being. Yeah. But I think we're going to get a shift from those vendors, and we are going to see a dip in both the player number for the main events for non-modern, uh, non-pioneer events. Enough. Yep. So that's ba that's basically sealed of sealed Magic Fests, and standard Magic Fest attendance will drop, which means we're going to see vendor pullback as well as the ROI on those events get worse, and we might actually see more people move on to the Star City circuit. And Which is great, because then they'll do what they did before and come back to Legacy, even though they're not doing that, I am sure. Never. He released a statement about it. Yeah, he just bring, bring back uh, the Vintage 10K, it's fine. Or 50K, yeah. whatever it was. But we might see an expansion of that circuit or another competing circuit pop up to take care of the West Coast. Yep. Because Star City is basically middle of, middle of the continental U.S. and East, uh, leaving the West Coast to nobody because it's just too far for them to move their stuff over there that that's fine like yeah by all means logistically that i'm sure that's hell coming from a company on the east coast to truck out to the west that's got to be terrible yeah, with no is. yeah with no satellite office right so yeah. even if cfb you know they're contracted through 2020 even if they back out and they do their own on the west or if nrg picks it up because i know a lot of people are looking at their tournament series we might begin to see that we might see a fracture in the player base where anybody who wants to play a little more competitively that you can qualify for uh, what is effectively the Pro Tour now through these independent events. Yeah. You might see you more You start vendors. to see these independent events pop up more. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's interesting because before when they had, you know, you could just queue for the PT uh, off the Star Cities years ago. Yeah, yeah. They gave that them that like for a hot the, minute. The heyday of the Star City Tour. And now we're getting back to a time where that may be possible again. Mm -hmm. And I think that, like you said, like Star City, you know, for, I think, genuinely better, uh, you'll probably see them start to take off 
Like that's just going I, to happen. Because I would hope so. Yeah. I, I don't see why you can't run this, but with those additional circuits comes, generally speaking, reduced table costs compared yeah. to a Magic Fest. But right now, the number of unique players to vendor is lower at these events. So yeah. it is a little dicey for a vendor, a vendor to move into, which is kind of a unique situation. A lot of people might think, oh, you got to pay 6K, 6K, 6K to get into a Magic Fest. There are going to be however many thousands of unique people in that room. That's going to be not. great. But still There's not only, even a thousand unique people. At this sometimes, point. yeah. <laughs> like you might like 200 or somewhere around like 120 to 150 is an okay event. North of 150 unique people per booth is best. At smaller events yeah. like this, you know, Star Cities generally track somewhere between four and 600 and can have upwards of six vendors sometimes. That's 100 people per booth, which puts you below that butter zone. So the more but it's a star city, so you can pay dirt and it's fine. It's true. There is that there is that element to it. Or <laughs> or you just bring near mint cards. That one's yeah. Pretty, you know, nothing that's signed, nothing that's uh, LP or a worse, and you just have your own niche right there. But yeah. as these alternative tournament scenes come up, much like the TCG player series, you might see vendors back out of Magic Fest, move over to these events, and it becomes easier for people to sell cards and we're back to, you know, a, a time where Star City was trekking across the country and GPs were every weekend in the U.S. moving across the country, and there wasn't yeah. a time where somebody couldn't drive like three to five hours to get to a GP, and things were super liquid, and the game was super hot. I mean, it's, you know, even looking, it, it seems like what we're seeing, based on the Star City Tour, is that they're trying to move back to that already. I mean, you've got an event in Knoxville, Indianapolis, which is usual, uh, is Cincinnati, Louisville, like you've got, I think it's six total, Midwest events yeah. in the first half of the year, which is how many they used to do in a year. So there's still Nashville that hasn't been touched and Memphis, which aren't mm -hmm. in the first half. Yeah. So I think we can expect to see that in season two. So it's like they're trying to, you know, especially now with Wizards announcing this new format, standards bad, it's a prime opportunity for someone like this to come in. Yeah. And like you said, just start doing these nationwide events that start attracting more players to them, especially since now you can queue for the Pro Tour through them. Yeah, and that's more opportunity for people to go out and trade again or yeah. to, to move cards around in region. And you, like, I love and I hate the guy that's like, I'm here with a list of cards to get for my friends to bring back home because that, that person is doing the Lord's work for their friend yeah. group. That means there are no stores in the area that carry these cards they're so unique or they're so expensive that they need to go out and do something else. We might see the rise of those people now. Yeah. Again. And and it's awesome that this is a thing that can be done and it just helps move cards around more and helps keep things liquid and it helps players just churn through their own stock. I don't think we'll see, you know, the backpack grinder come back, but financially this is not bad overall because vendors can continue to go out to these additional uh, locations and just make it easier for people to move cards around and refocus their stock to resell then locally. Yeah. And that's great opportunity. You know, we talked about Facebook Marketplace a long time ago. We stopped talking about it because, you know, it's not like the local scenes are, are dying, but some are. Yeah. So it's difficult. Like I no longer have a good insight into that space because my local, my local stuff's dead. But with this, yeah. you know, that it, it does broaden the horizons and open things up again. And it's, in the short term, it's great. I'm I'm sure the 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 long term plan is something different. I, it's going to be awful. Can't wait. <laughs> I, don't, I I I would hope that they fix arena, they make it playable, they get rid of paper standard, and they, like the the conversation that Tolarian Community College had with with uh, Kenobi was great because I this is a model I can believe in where you're only selling EDH product. And you're making much more of it because you're no longer making standard. You're making a bunch of supple and that and other supplemental sets just go to to work with the uh, the formats that are already in existence. So you you can sell standard on online on Arena. That's where everything is. That's where you move your pre-releases to, etc. Or maybe you do some cool paper pre-releases for these additional supplementals again, and you just put all your eggs in that basket for these older formats, and that's how you support them. You know, you yeah. don't have to play standard in paper anymore. You can play it in arena. You yeah, can like just arena. You can play old stuff in paper and moto. 
Yeah, and you Which can would be great. And Arena is a much slicker format for a lot of what's going on. You don't have to worry about uh, ordering your triggers, although it is still a little odd that the window for triggers is only so big, and there are yeah. decks in the format that just blow past that window. But I, that's a model I can actually believe in, and I wouldn't like the timeline you're you're giving. I would not ex would not not expect that in the next four to five years. I don't know how far yeah. we are, but. I think this is a, a clear view and clear way forward. But that all goes to say that, to the original issue, investing in formats that have the ability to be with cards to be reprinted at any moment is yeah. difficult and kind of a, drives a hard bargain to want to move into those as a financial avenue. Yeah. You just got to be careful. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see because, like, you know, I've, I've been around since Chronicles. Uh, and this feels like the first time since Chronicles that I genuinely feel mm -hmm. magic may be dead or dying. Like, I, you know, obviously Chronicles was a disaster. Yeah. Like, yeah. We, we know why, yeah. Yeah, we have the reserve list because it was so bad. Yeah, we we have sure. a we have a shortcut command in the Discord to print the reserve list for a reason. <laughs> yeah, you can you can point yeah. to a set. Yeah, and this is the first time that I've been able to say like you know what I think this may actually be happening. Mm -hmm. Like this this is very real. This could be the end. I so. I yeah I I love the fact that you're always the doomsayer here. Yeah, but this is the one time where I can also go look back, starting at Cons of Tark here, and say, "All right, we had a green black meta game into a green black meta game into a green black meta game into a control meta game into a green black meta game, and here we are, just having banned a green blue X deck yeah. by effectively getting rid of Oko." Yep. So. Great. Yeah, it, it's I think it's just like a number of awkwardly botched standards again and again and again, and uh, to your point, it does feel like the game is has begun to fade out faster now than it has previously. Yeah. You know, uh, we said it last week or the week before, we were talking about the number of bannings in 2019 compared to previous years. Even after all the affinity cards were still banned, the states that I went to that September after, uh, what is it? What was the first? Uh, Champions of Kamigawa was released. Yeah. It's still capped. Yeah, like when states was a thing, and we were capping at like a hundred plus players, and we had play people on affinity in that room. Yeah, and and like as bad as that was, as bad as Callblade was, this doesn't feel as bad as Callblade, and that's awful. Yeah, yeah, and they they cited like uh, downward pressure because of attendance, you know, as a reason to ban those cards. Like, people didn't want to buy them, they didn't want to play with them, they just weren't coming to events, so they had to get rid of them. And this is where we are. But the thing is, standard is still bad after those cards were removed. So what do you have to do? You have to wait for the next set and hope. And then after that, yeah. you have to wait for the next set and hope. And that then you have the first paper, uh, standard Magic Fest and I don't know how long. Yeah. It's just dumb. Play older formats, you'll be better players because of it. The end. It's great. Yeah. Play Legacy. It's Agreed. not dead. No. Uh, All right. Yeah. Moving into picks. Yes. Uh, you want to go first? Yeah, I'll All go right. first. So I am going for Tarmogoyf, specifically Ultimate Masters. It's single-use art. Uh, and Tarmogoyf is literally, since the Future Sight printing, at the lowest price point it has ever been at. Yep. Ever. So... It's Tarmogoyf. Like, at some point, it's going to recover. It's one of the most efficient two-drops ever printed. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, like, I think still a top-five blue creature. Uh, no, it's top ten. It's It's been pushed out. I'll admit that. We've got Bob, Stoneforge, Snap. Uh, Renin Six is basically a blue creature. Yep. Um, you know, there, there's better two-drop blue creatures out there. But it's certainly top ten. It's an incredibly good threat in modern. Like, there's just a lot of reasons that this card has been what it has for as long as it has. Mm -hmm. And it does go through periods where it sees more and less play. Yes. And right now, it is seeing significantly less play. And you know what? 
That is why it is as affordable as it is. I don't think that sticks around. I don't think it should. No. Like, it, it's... It's Tarmogoyf. Like, that's that's the end of my argument. It's I'm, Tarmogoyf. It's I'm, the lowest it's ever been. Bye. I, that's it. Yeah, because the moment it comes back, it's going to come back gangbusters. And I'm going to check this real quick, because I'm pretty sure... It's floating around in modern in a Sultai deck with Oko, but I'm not 100% on that. So before... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there it is. At the beginning of December onward, it's actually in Death Shadow. Yeah. And Sultai midrange. Okay, that's what I was seeing. Yeah. So we are seeing it be be played. It's just not... Modern's not getting a lot of play right now. Death Shadow yeah. is one of the best decks. And it's been in a number of... Let's see. League, 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 5K, and a PTQ. Yeah. Like, it, it's top still eight putting of them up all. results. It's just not getting the price to correlate to that. So what I think the problem is, and I was talking to somebody about this last week because I wanted to play FM, and uh, this is uh, somebody I spent hours testing both Death Shadow and Amulet with. I said, I'm going to FNM, what do I play? And they said, yeah. uh, I think it was, uh, look at Dylan Donegan's Death Shadow list. Sure. He plays Oko, not Tarmogoyf. That's the difference. The package is a little bit different. So if if you're looking at a version of Death Shadow that's that's a little more high profile, meaning that more people are going to see it because it, it is a little more open, a little more visible, you're going to find yeah. one of these lists from Star City and a team like that that's going to be playing Oko and not Tarmogoyf. Yeah. But people are still playing it in basically the, ex the exact same deck otherwise. And it's great. It is. Like, I bought my Future Sight Goyfs for... Uh, a buck twenty, and they're eighty right now. So in the end, I'm not losing that much. But like, just to get goifs, I have yet to sleeve up. I'm every time it drops, I hate myself a little more. Yeah. I told myself I'd play Rug Delver and Legacy at some point, so I bought the goifs, and then they unbent. Then they bent Deathrite Shaman, so I played Reanimator instead, and that's not a Tomar Goyf deck. No, it's not. There are better blue creatures in that deck. Yeah. Crystal Brand, Iona, Elishnorn. Those, those are not blue cards, unfortunately. Ah, uh, you want to tell me that Gristlebrand is not a blue card? Okay, Gristlebrand is a blue card. That's the only one that is, though. The only way you put him into play... Two-thirds of the way you put him into play are blue. You yeah, put that's, into play. that's very true. Yeah. Hey, come on. Uh, I'll, I'll, Elish Norton and the other targets, I'm okay with. Yeah. Sphinx of the Steel Wind is literally a blue card, though. Yep. Along with Ty, uh, Tide Spot Tyrant. But, all right, that, we're, we're diverging here. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Uh, uh, so yeah, that's that's basically that's that's my argument. It's that's fine. I think I spent more end. time writing out my reasoning for this card than you did explaining Tarmogoyf, which is great. Uh, my pick for this week is finally Sunbird's Invocation. So, yeah, my stack's in a box. Uh, yeah. It it hit its its max at about two dollars, let's say in September of last year, and it just kind of crested down. But the one thing that I've been watching is the the market value against the average and they've been coming together for a little while right now yeah and they haven't uh market hasn't overtaken average and i think the reason i picked it is because i believe we're going to see this happen soon this is a yeah. card that's now like out of sight out of mind it's fairly far removed from standard and it's it's a known quantity but it hasn't shown up in ed in an eight in an edh video in a very long time like, Star City has them. The Commander vs. Guys uh, haven't played it. Like, um, Spike Feeders haven't played it in a while. But it is very popular in EDH Rec. So people are playing this, but it just doesn't have the visibility that I mentioned earlier. So once that happens, it's going to go, right? Yeah. I Once, you know, someone, Saffron, or whoever picks it up in a deck tech. There you go. And we've we've been on this card since the set released. Literally. Yeah. What I found interesting about this was that uh, if you look at EDH rec and then you search for the... You just look at a top cards by color filter red. It is in the top 14 cards of uh, for mono red. The 15th is uh, Ruby Sapphire. The 16th is Wheel of Fortune. So this card right now is more popular than Wheel of Fortune is in mono red decks in uh, on EDH or base red decks on EDH rec. Seems pretty good. Uh, of, 
I don't know exactly how they got this number of uh, 100,000 decks. It might be all decks contain that might be all decks containing red. It's in about seven percent of them, which isn't too great. I'd like to see somewhere uh, about 12, 15 would definitely mean that we're we're looking uh, to a spike. They'll probably bring this towards four to five dollars rather than the three that I see incoming. Yeah, and this is. Generally in a deck that's going to quote unquote cascade into large things. So when you look at the decks this is in, these are in like big mono red decks or green red big X. Dumb stuff. Yep, exactly. Uh, so Maelstrom, Wanderer, Zakama, Atali, Dracoseth, uh, Lathless. These are like the top generals for yeah. for this card. And they're aside from Maelstrom, Wanderer, and Zakama, uh, the rest of the generals on this are like super not pillow forty, but super casual generals. Yeah. The other two, and as we harp on constantly, casuals drive the market. the market. Right. The other two are just a little more cutthroat. They're it's not harder to build. They just do the same thing every time, so they're a little more competitive. Yeah. But this is a card that swings both ways in regards to that. Then the last point I want to make about this is this is the only printing of this card. Ixalan, and then the promo. From ex yep. from uh, the Exelon pre-release, there's no promo pack of this. It's not in an EDH set. It hasn't been in a supplemental. It is in the Core Twenty promo pack. Oh, there's no price for that though. Uh, there is on TCG Player. That is interesting. That Stocks is not tracking that. Yeah, Stocks is not tracking it, but it is listed on TCG Player, uh, which is similar to. So speaking from like an inventory perspective, right? We have separated out the promo pack stuff, yep. even though it's a nightmare logistically. Uh, it is also more expensive for the promo pack version than the regular version. Yep. Mystery packs, mystery deck cards, most vendors aren't touching because of what a nightmare it is for inventory. Yes. So this will be interesting to monitor going forward because it may be that the promo packs, after they get large enough mm -hmm. and there's enough in that card pool, you don't see prices anywhere for them, similar to the mystery pack. Got it. So. That, which is fine. So this Corset 2020 means those packs are gone. They've been they've been gone for a hot minute. Yeah, which can they, lend it. they have been gone, yeah. Yeah, so when I go back and I, I look at July 19, that's we're going to go back and look. Core 2020 hits, and it just, the uh, the market takes a huge dump, but it eventually comes back. So that's what we're, what we're looking at now, is now yeah. the site, like I said uh, earlier, out of sight, out of mind. This card is just... Yeah, you know, that's gone, exactly what it is. Gone from public view. It's going to take a lot to buy this card out of the uh, out of TCG player, foil, non-foil, if that's how it's going to move the needle. But I believe organic demand will take hold of this card. And for a dollar and change, regardless of which version you get, it's going to be an easy turn uh, easy. sometime in, in the coming year. I don't have a timeline on it. My, my timeline was long when I picked it up at, uh, at release. I would not yeah. be surprised if... 2021 is where I can get out at a buy price that is 1.5x to double my my buy-in, but I yeah. think anything below two dollars uh, is great. Anything less than a dollar fifty is where you want to be right now. Yeah, uh, you know it's it's similar talking about timelines to me with like unbound flourishings. I'm up to about 200 now, and I've decided rather than timeline, it's number. Uh, you know, when buy list hits ten dollars each, I'll out. Yeah. Which make which makes sense. I mean, that's we were picking them up at. I want to say six. Yeah, ten. and I've been picking them up like gangbusters since I picked it at two dollars when it bottomed out. Yeah. So, I I will be greedy about that one. And that's fine. That that it's also something good to mention that you don't have to just pick a date. You can pick a number that you're happy yeah. to get out of. Uh, I I took, I got on my smugglers copters when I was happy with the the number five on each. Yeah. I didn't want to get too greedy because I bought in at a dollar to two after they were banned up here because I figured somebody would realize that you could just shove a Memnite into a smuggler's copter and eventually just putter off that way. Uh, yeah. Eventually somebody shoved a merfolk in there and that happened instead. It was great. Yep. But uh, anything more than that, I felt it was greedy and I might get hoisted again. So out. There was no timeline on that card. It was just yeah. sit on the bunch I had and then out on when I felt uh, appropriate. Is the number good? Great. Number's good. Yep. See you later. Yep. And uh, to give you an example on Sunbird's Invocation, uh, when we first talked about buying in, when we first started all this stuff, uh, I bought, my average was like 53 cents per copy. Jeez. So we've that seen it almost, great. yeah, a, a little over double heading north towards the triple up. And that's even from Channel. 
Wow. Like, I think I bought Channel out at 50 a piece. Twice. Yeah. Actually, yeah, I remember when you bought them out the second time. Yeah. I was like, there's no reason they should have reloaded at the exact same price. That's wrong. <laughs> yeah. Buy them. So, that was 2018. That was pre the core 2020 pre-release. Uh, sorry, core be prior to that pack. So this card does have legs and wings. And it yeah. will be on an upward trajectory once it's gone. If it gets printed again in another supplemental, it'll probably stagnate for another fairly long time. And, yeah. and eventually it'll just turn into a perennial EDH card as people move more into just big dumb things. I think you're fine holding on to it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that's a good one. I like it. Me too. I would hope so. That's your pick. Exactly. <laughs> But I think with that, uh, we are done for today. Uh, yep. Over the coming weeks, we're actually going to be doing another series for the holidays. So we'll have a, uh, a guest on. Uh, she is a local of mine that I've known since 2004, 2005. Uh, she's also a patron of ours. So good on her. But uh, we hope you enjoy that series coming up. With that, though. Uh, we are at MTG Cabalcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Patreon. I am at Halt I am Reptar on Twitter. You are at Thirsty Sizzler on the Twitter. There it is. And we'll see you next week. Yep. Uh, and real quick, I do want to give a shout out to Tom50, who mentioned the podcast in his trade with us on Cardsphere. Oh, nice. Which everyone should check out. Cardsphere's dope. Yeah, uh, that's great for us. Yep. But that's it. We see. will see you next week. Deuces. See you guys.